Monday, April the 4th, 2022, and welcome back to Goodfellows, a Hoover Institution broadcast examining social, economic, political, and geopolitical concerns. I'm Bill Whalen. I'm a Hoover Distinguished Policy Fellow, and I'll be doing the moderating today. Uh, this is a show featuring three of the wisest gentlemen I know, Hoover's Goodfellows, as we jokingly refer to them. That includes the historian Neil Ferguson, the economist John Cochran, and the geostrategist Lieutenant General H.R. McMaster. They are Hoover Institution Senior Fellows all. And this week, we're joined by yet another Hoover Senior Fellow, Michael McFall. Mike McFall is a professor of political science and director and senior fellow at Stanford Freeman Spoley Institute for International Studies. From January 2012 to February 2014, he served as U.S. Ambassador to the Russian Federation. That was after three years at the National Security Council, H.R. McMaster's old stomping ground, serving as senior director for Russian and foreign affairs. Ambassador McFall, welcome to Goodfellows. Thanks for having me. Okay, Mike, I want you to settle a debate that we have. So John, H.R., and Neil are convinced that you, like Vladimir Putin, bathe in the blood of Dira Iller blood. True or not? <laughs> Say that again. I, I missed the first part. Uh, Vladimir Putin reportedly bathes in the blood of deer antlers. It's supposedly it's a longevity <laughs> treatment or something like that. So true or false, you do the same. <laughs> uh, well, I definitely don't do the same, but I've never heard that about Mr. Putin, but it wouldn't surprise me. So I raise that for this point, Mike, because there's all sorts of stuff going around the internet about Vladimir Putin these days. There is the deer antler blood story going around. I saw a report that he supposedly is hunkered down at a bunker in eastern Siberia. Reports that he's taken his family, has stashed them away. Various accounts of who he talks to and who he doesn't, how isolated he is or not. Uh, you have actually sat down with the man and tried to talk reason with him over a decade ago, mind you. Tell us a bit about what you think he is going through right now, because he would be seeing seemingly facing genuine adversity. He is not getting the information that he wants from his uh, associates. How does he handle this situation? Well, first of all, thanks for having me. Uh, great group and congratulations on this program. Um, so, you know, Putin and I go way back. I first met him in the spring of 1991. Um, I first wrote my article. My, the first article I wrote about Putin was in March of 2000. Um, uh, it was called Indifference to Democracy. That uh, was an understatement, but warning about this guy is going to push Russia in an autocratic direction. And I just had to do, I did a Google search on my CV the other day, and I have 60 articles or books with the word Putin in them. Uh, just to, to remind you that, that we go way back. I've, I've thought about him a lot. I dealt with him for five years in the government. Uh, he really doesn't like me. Uh, he made that clear when I served in Moscow and I'm on the sanctions list. I, I was on the first wave of sanctions back in 2014 and, and I don't like him. So I wanna make sure I say that before I try to analytically answer your question, okay? Um, but let me say a couple of things analytically. Um, first of all, he's been isolated for a long, long time, not just COVID. Uh, even when I was ambassador, we were writing a lot of cables about how isolated he was back in you know, 2012, 13, 14. Uh, he'd already been in power for a long time, 15 years, um, and now he's been in power 22 years. So think about what happens in any organization where you have a leader around for that long. They stop listening to their advisors. You know, what, what, is, what is Sergei Lavrov going to tell Putin about the international world? He doesn't listen to Lavrov, his foreign minister at all. Uh, number two, you get, you get tired of going to meetings. Uh, by our accounts, he'd only came to work two or three times a day, two or three times a week, excuse me, into Moscow back in 2014. He lives out in this compound outside of town. I've, I've been there a few times. Uh, and people come to him. Uh, and that was all before COVID. Uh, and then once COVID hit, he became even more isolated. Uh, and when people say he's suicidal and he's willing to risk nuclear war, I, I would just point out that look at all those meetings he has with his generals and his advisors are like, you know, 200 feet away from him. This is a guy that's not uh, trying to, to, to commit suicide, nuclear holocaust anytime soon. But as a result of that, he, he does live in this bubble. Uh, third thing I would say about him that I, that, again, these are things that were true when I was in the government and they're even more true today, is he only, he only listens and reads information that comes through him through secret channels. Right. Remember, he's a former KGB guy. And by the way, uh, there's no such thing as a former KGB guy. You're always in the KGB if you, you're part of that uh, network within Russia and the Soviet Union. But but those guys and I, I listen to him and because he has all these crazy ideas about us, uh, which maybe we'll get to later. Um, he 
he privileges anything that's marked, you know, Savarshena Sekretna, the top secret at the top of it. And, and I want to tell you, I, I don't know, uh, HR, if you had this problem too, but, but I, I want to tell you when I first joined the government and I started getting things that were labeled top secret, I started to privilege that over things that, that the Hoover fellows would write. It's like, well, they don't know anything. If this is secret information, it must be true. Well, remember, he's been living in that bubble his whole life. He doesn't surf the internet. He doesn't interact with independent journalists. And so, so that's the world he's lived in. And then the last thing I would say, from his perspective, uh, until the last month and a half or so, he's been on uh, a, pretty, a pretty fantastic run. So for the last 20 years, uh, he has built the Russian economy back. He brought Russia back from its knees, from the economic depression that they lived through, through the 1990s. Now, my own view is that causation is not correlation. Uh, he showed up at just the right time, uh, you know, after they finally got through the reforms and then oil and gas prices took off. But all presidents around the world take credit for things that happen on their watch, and he did. So he had that legacy going for him inside his own country. He had squashed the opposition. So, you know, Mr. Navalny's in jail. Uh, independent media has been pushed to the sidelines. Uh, and he just fought four wars before this one where he won. Uh, you know, what definitions of winning we can get into, but Chechnya, 99, 1999, 2000, Georgia, 2008, Ukraine, 2014, Syria, 2015. And therefore, up to this moment, uh, in that world, he was winning, and I think he overreached in Ukraine. Uh, I think this is his Afghanistan, like Brezhnev's Afghanistan. He miscalculated how easy it was going to be because of that bubble that I was just describing. And therefore, Bill, I think he's pretty frustrated right now. If you listen to him every when he talks, and I do every chance, he doesn't talk that much, but when he does, uh, he sounds like a pretty frustrated guy that things are not going according to plan. Mike, can I ask you a question? Uh, back in the late 90s, I wrote a piece with Brigitte Granville called Weimar on the Volga. And our argument was that the inflationary mess that, uh, that Russia had descended into uh, in the Yeltsin era was going to have an ugly sequel. I feel as if we are now seeing that play out and that Russia has become under Putin a fascist regime. Do you agree with that? Well, Neil, I've gotten in trouble the other <laughs> recently. I know that's why. Oh, so that's why I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave. I, I want to know what, what, what you say, because uh, you're the real historian and, and HR is I'm not. But let me tell you my, let me say some things that I've written as well. So back, back in uh, the, the summer of 1990, one of the more, I've gotten lots of things wrong. I, I want to be clear. I'm cherry picking now, um, but it's you know it's on the historical record. Neil, you and I, we have to live with what we publish, right? We don't get to delete the things we don't like. Um, uh, I wrote in the summer of 1990 where I compared the French Revolution and the Bolshevik Revolution to what I called the Soviet Revolution, uh, and I'm very conscious of the fact that I'm speaking to historians now and very nervous, therefore. Uh, but I, I walked through, uh, um, um, you know, this very famous book, Neil, by Crane Britton, uh, Anatomy of Revolution. I was reading it at the time. I, I was living in the Soviet Union at the time, back and forth. Uh, I spent the academic year of 1990-91 at Moscow State University. And, and I wrote this piece saying, this feels like a great revolution to me. Um, and I went through the stages of Crane Britain, uh, but I said, there will be Thermidor after this. This is summer of 1990, right? So the Soviet Union still exists. Uh, and, and eventually there will be uh, somebody that comes, you know, a, a strong man. And I compared them to Napoleon and Stalin. I didn't say who it was, but I said there will be this reaction, the counter revolution, and a strong man who will create law and order. Um, uh, I also, but then I got some things wrong. Um, I wrote my Weimar pieces, Neil, um, and I wrote several of them uh, in 1993. And I wrote them when Vladimir Zhirinovsky. Uh, a, a nationalist leader of the Liberal Democratic Party of Russia, neither liberal or democratic. But I was in Russia as an electoral observer the night he won election uh, in December. He won quarter of the vote, it was a complete surprise. 
And that's when the, the Weimar analogy for me, it seemed like he was Hitler. And I got that wrong. It turned out that Hitler came from within the system. I, I'm gonna le let you make the analogies, but it, it, the nationalist populist leader with all the grievances came from within, not from without. And that, you know, that's a paradox. Like why did Boris Yeltsin uh, make a bet on this guy? I mean, let's be honest, Putin was a complete opportunist in the 1990s. He was not like Hitler, right? He was in the system. Uh, and when he lost his job in, in St. Petersburg, when he was the deputy mayor, that's when I met him, he was the deputy mayor for this guy, Anatoly Subchak, a pro-Western, pro-democratic, pro-European, charismatic guy. Um, and that's why I was interacting with him. I was working for an NGO, an American NGO, a democracy promoting NGO. And they, we were there as the guest of Mr. Subchak. And I wanna make that clear because Putin wants you to think that we were all there uh, overthrowing regimes. It was a group called the National Democratic Institute, NDI. Uh, we were invited by them and Putin was our host for God's sakes. Um, and his deputy, a guy named Igor Sechin, was the guy that I was deciding between, you know, we're gonna have Fisher beef for our conference. That, that was the job I had with a guy named Igor Sechin. He now runs Rosneft. Um, but I think it's important to I understand that for the 90s, uh, Putin was in the system. He was not, you know, lamenting the system. And when he lost his job, as deputy mayor, by the way, he lost it in a free and fair election, kind of an incredible thing to remember. Um, it was Boris Yeltsin's chief of staff uh, in, in the, you know, uh, for Boris Yeltsin, who was president at the time, that reinvigorated his career. His name is Anatoly Chibayas. Uh, and that he was in the system and was, you know, through some pretty accidental circumstances chosen as president. Uh, in 2000, that the heir apparent was a guy, you remember this, Neil, uh, Boris Nemtsov. Uh, he was the one being recruited, uh, brought to Moscow in 97 to be part of the new liberal government. But then there was this thing called, as we call it, an exogenous shock, right? Uh, an external variable, the August 1998 financial collapse uh, that wiped out that government because Russia was still a kind of quasi-democracy. And to stabilize things, they picked eventually Putin, a couple other people were in between, but then they picked uh, Putin as prime minister and then he became president. And I just say that because it was not clear to me and not clear most certainly to guys like Anatoly Chubias, who, who by the way, is one of the first major elites to defect. He's in yep. Istanbul right now. Um, it was not clear that he would become the Weimar-like character that he did. But, but Neil, I, I'd love to hear you say well, more I, about I, it. I brought this up because you, you kind of had to walk back a comparison with Hitler. And I felt like um, actually we shouldn't walk it back too far. Clearly, it's, a, it's always dangerous to draw comparisons between any historic figure, any contemporary figure and Hitler. But I think one can compare the regime that now exists in Russia with the fascist regime uh, uh, in the following sense. Many people wrongly think that because of Putin's origins in the KGB, he must be bent on resurrecting the Soviet Union. And I've been saying for many years, that's not the point, that yes. there is this toxic cocktail of Russian nationalism, orthodoxy, imperial nostalgia in the Putin uh, Weltanschauung worldview, which is distinctly fascistic. Uh, and if you watched the recent rally in the Moscow soccer stadium, that was a fascist event. And moreover, if you look at the way in which the Russian troops are conducting themselves uh, in Ukraine, uh, it looks an awful lot like fascism in action, not least the appalling scenes that we've now seen uh, in film clips from uh, Bucha. I, I think, although it's a mistake to say Putin's Hitler, because as you rightly say, the career paths are radically different, that somehow or other under Putin's leadership, Russia has ended up uh, as a fascist regime with a fascist ideology and fascist modes uh, of operation, including, of course, bumping off uh, political opponents along the way, which was another thing that Putin did. He wasn't a fascist to begin with. And this has been a process that took longer than I predicted. I, I thought back in 2000, when we published that article, that the transition from Weimar to, to the authoritarian fascist Russia that I feared would be faster. But let me give you a last snippet. And then I want to hear from HR and John. 
I remember around the same time you were talking about when I was uh, making visits to Russia pre and and post the 1991 uh, breakup of the Soviet Union. I remember one day in the streets of St. Petersburg, I think, passing people who were selling audio cassettes of Nazi marching songs. They literally had cassettes of the Horst Vessel song. And I said to my friend, that's insane in Russia. They, they can't possibly be a market for the, the music of the Third Reich after all that the Third Reich did to Russia. He said, no, you don't understand the appeal of forbidden fruit. And this is a very important insight for me, that Russia was of the European states, and it is a partly European state, the one that didn't have fascism, where fascism was forbidden fruit, where the official propaganda of the Soviet Union constantly demonized it in language that's now being resuscitated by Putin. And yet there was this appeal. So I'm, I'm going to kind of stick with you. He's not Hitler, but this is a fascist Russia that we're dealing with. Okay, right. enough. I'd like to add to, it, it's, uh, it's a we didn't want to call it fascist or the same system. It's, it's the same fascist economic model as the fascist regimes. A uh, nominally private uh, industry run by uh, a, a bunch of oligarch kleptocrats um, uh, with their own little monopoly sources who trade vast wealth for political support of the regime. Uh, in addition to, right, you got it all, nationalist. There's sort of, there's a racial, the great wonders of the Slavic people uh, mixed with religion. Um, it, it has all those ingredients, whatever we want to label it. HR. Hey, Mike, I just wanted to tie into the to the conversation that you're having with Neil to ask you, do we focus too much on Putin himself, right? Yes. And and yeah. and, uh, and and what about this sort of revanchist, you know, hyper-nationalist class that that came in with him and consolidated power under him, and and this predated, I think, the '98 financial crisis. Right, there was this this listlessness in in Russia in the in the '90s, even before the financial crisis. And and I'm thinking of Yeltsin's empowerment of of uh, of Primakov, for example, and and bringing in this class uh, that 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 really is now in control. Uh, you know, in in the you know in the parliament or the general assembly and so forth. And and so what has to happen in terms of change is not just Putin leaving, right? Isn't it really the defeat of this kind of, we could, we're could we talking about fascism, but I think it's really a revanchist, hyper-nationalist class that, it, that has come in with him. What do you think the prospects are of change there? And of course, this involves the oligarchs, as John is saying, you know, those who are super empowered by their ability to, to affect, really capture over former state enterprises and enrich themselves. They're, they, they've bought into this, this hyper-nationalist program uh, with Putin. I, I want to add to that, that this analogy tells us in some extent it was always thus, focusing on, on Putin's mental state uh, and his isolation. Well, Hitler was isolated. Mussolini was isolated. Perhaps in his later days, Napoleon was isolated. How about and Stalin? That's, I, lo I love the movie, The, the Death of Stalin. The Death I mean, of Stalin just... <laughs> was, was wonderful. I demand my rights. Article Will you stop uh, you know, <laughs> 15 years of dictatorship, you end up isolated. You have, as you said, there's your cronies around you. There's the, the Goerings and the Ribbentrops and so forth who have to go with you. But focusing on, on uh, Putin is crazy seems to be a mistake because Hitler was also crazy, but he managed to kill a whole lot of people while he was still crazy. Right. Um, so a couple of reactions. These are great questions. And, and I don't want to pretend to have great answers. Um, but I, I would say, HR, to your question first, um, it's a mix of structure and agency. Uh, you know, I think, uh, uh, you know, in my field of political science, we you have to slow, you have to slow down and explain that to the historians. Well, are these structural forces that created <laughs> Putin or is Putin an, an autonomous agent? And of course, the right answer is it's a combination of both. I think in my discipline these days, uh, we tend to write out uh, agency. We tend to say that uh, individuals don't matter. It's partly because we can't measure them very well. So we say that they don't matter. Same with regimes, uh, same with interest groups. So that, that's probably a debate for another day, the, 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 you know, where political science has gone wrong. Um, uh, Mr. Mersheimer, for instance, I think has made some really uh, radically wrong statements about the causes of this, this war. But let's come back to that because a, a couple of things are true, HR. Um, uh, the deal with nationalists in the democratic movement in the Soviet Union definitely predates Putin. Uh, and I, I, you know, I wrote a book about this and I, I was, you know, I, I know a lot of these actors personally. It was, it goes all the way to back to Boris Yeltsin. Boris Yeltsin, uh, if you talk to our, our director, Condoleezza Rice, ask her what she thinks of Boris Yeltsin. He, you know, he was some drunk nationalist. 
populist, right? And the, the, the liberal democratic forces in the Soviet Union uh, made a deal. They knew that they were the minority and that they were not gonna win elections without an alliance with a guy like Yeltsin. And they'd made that alliance knowing all along that this was a, that they we didn't have the same views. Remember when he ran for president, this is still the Soviet Union, uh, his vice presidential candidate was General Rutskoy, not exactly a you know, liberal Democrat westernizer. And that, that has always been this precarious alliance. Number two, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, they made some mistakes. Uh, there were some things that were bigger that they couldn't do. Uh, but one big, I think, in retrospect, uh, some of my liberal democratic friends from the 90s would agree, they decided that they weren't powerful enough to shut down the KGB and to break up the KGB. And so they did a deal with them. Uh, you're absolutely right. They did not, you know, they did not do denazification, you know, to, to pull on, uh, you know, analogies, uh, what they, you know, that and I, I want to be clear, I, I, I'm not going to prejudge whether they had the power to do it or not. But Yeltsin thought if he was going to do that, that would lead to a counter revolution from those forces. So he tried to co-opt them. Mm -hmm. um, and as a result of that co-option, they did in the 90s in this very, you know, difficult, complicated alliance uh, 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 exist side by side with more liberal democratic forces. Number three, on the oligarchs, let's be, let's be careful and let's break that down a little bit. Because in the 90s, the oligarchs, and I knew almost all of them uh, over that period and when I was ambassador, um, they were, they're a very different group than the folks that support Putin today. They, they, they made their money through these corrupt you know, loans for shares programs in the 90s with the Yeltsin entourage. Um, uh, and then, you know, 98 happened. And then there's like, who, who can we put in power that's going to guarantee our property rights? And they basically landed on this guy, Putin. You know, Boris Berezovsky, one of the oligarchs from the 90s, he was one of the central people pushing for Putin. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and then Putin came into power. And then the first thing he did is he took over media because he understood media would be a threat to him. And then the second thing he did, he said to the oligarchs, the 90s oligarchs, Either you leave town uh, or get out of politics. Uh, and so two of the big ones, Mr. Gusinski and Mr. Berzowski left. Uh, another one, Mr. Hartakovsky said, oh, I'm gonna try to fight this guy. He ended up spending 10 years in jail. Um, and, and basically the 90s oligarchs either made their peace with Putin or they left. And we're, we're focusing way too much on those guys and their power. You know, like Abramovich is going to tell Putin what to do. Give me a break. Uh, they all got to keep their fortunes because he allowed them to do it. Or, like I said, Gusinski's in Israel. Berezovsky's dead. Hartikovsky spent 10 years in jail. And, and, and the rest made their peace with them. In the 2000s, he then redistributed property uh, to his cronies, to his KGB guys. And let's just focus on two, just for, for purposes. The Soloviki, can you explain this whole, you know, yeah, the, the Soloviki, that's, yeah, right. that's the code word. Uh, right. uh, by the way, when I was ambassador HR, uh, our own guys, our own generals and our own CIA and, and FBI guys, they call, they self-styled themselves as a Soloviki uh, <laughs> at, at country team meetings. And they were thrilled when I came. Uh, there was a bit of tension between the Siliviki and our embassy and some of the others. But let, let's leave that for another day. Yeah, the, the Siliviki are the strong men, right? They're, they're people from intelligence, military. Although there's tension between KGB guys and generals. Maybe we should come back to that too. Long, and maybe long the St. Petersburg crowd and the non-St. Petersburg crowd. And there's that tension that too. too. Yeah. There's that tension too. But, but, but in essence, it, I'm oversimplifying, uh, but in an essence... He redistributed property, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so let's take this guy, Igor Sechin. Let's just focus it on him. So Igor, what, who is he when I meet him? He's an he's a aide to the deputy mayor of Moscow. He'd worked in intelligence. He'd been in Mozambique. And when he met me, he started speaking Portuguese with me because I, I used to work on Southern Africa. And he just assumed, and I know this now for a fact, that I was intelligence too. Um, um, and... But they, they, were, they were losing in the 90s, right? They were cut out of um, uh, privatization, those guys. So when Putin came in, he started to redistribute property to his guys. Alexei Miller, Gazprom, Igor Sechin, Rosneft. And Igor Sechin, Rosneft, he literally stole 
Hartikovsky's company, uh, this oil company that he had run at the time, it's called Yukos, and he moved those assets over to what is now called Rosneft and put his aid for 30 years in power in Rosneft. And I think that's very important for, for Westerners to understand this, this notion because there's a, there's a misconception, I think, that there's these rich you know, billionaires, you know, the kind of Bill Gates of the world uh, that, that are now being sanctioned. And so they're now going to go to the president and say, hey, man, this is really bad for me. you gotta, you got to stop this war. And what we don't understand is that Igor Sechin is a billionaire because Vladimir Putin made him a billionaire. Uh, so his leverage vis-a-vis -vis Putin it, 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 he has zero leverage. And don't get me wrong, I want those people to be sanctions. I want more and more and more and more sanctions. But I think we need to be uh, humble. We need to understand the distribution of power within that system is very different than in a, a capitalist society. And remember, there's no parliament. There's nowhere, they don't have their MPs that they can go lobby to say, hey, stop this war. There's either fear, so that the 90s oligarchs, they're all fearful of Putin, right? And most of them, not most, many of them now live in the West and, and fear him. Uh, and the, 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 the oligarchs uh, of the Putin era, they're completely loyal to him because they're rich only because of Mr. Putin. Oh, what you're saying is they know that when he goes, they go. <laughs> and that's another prop, John, that's a giant problem that, we, that in my world, people have discussed for a long time. You know, even when I was ambassador, you know, that's eight years ago, a decade ago, it was already clear Putin was kind of tired of being in power. You know, he, he was annoyed with all these meetings. That's why he didn't come to these meetings, right? He got tired of like showing up at the Kremlin and doing things that presidents are supposed to do. And there was lots of speculation he might step down, uh, but the people around him, the sections of the world, they can't let him step down because if they step down, their property rights are endangered. And that creates this self-enforcing, you know, moment that we have today. So, Mike, Mike, two questions for you. First of all, what does Vladimir Putin have to fear internally within Russia? Who who would threaten his rule? And then secondly, let's talk about settling this. How does he extricate himself from Ukraine? And let's talk about the various parties here. We've seen Russia's terms printed. They want a neutral Ukraine. They don't want foreign military on Ukrainian soil. Uh, they want the two breakaway republics in the Donbass. Uh, if you listen to Zelensky, he was on the Grammys last night. We defend our freedom to live, to love, to sound. On our land, we are fighting Russia, which brings horrible silence with its bombs, the dead silence. He sounds Churchillian. He wants the Russians out altogether. And there's a question of what the NATO allies like, what the Western concern is. There are competing schools of thought here in this country. Uh, a short war is better. No, a long war is better. So first of all, where is who is Putin afraid of within his own country? But then secondly, how does he get out of Ukraine cleanly in a way that he can sell to his people? Yeah, two hard questions that I'm, I'm gonna just have guesses for, not answers. First, within Russia, um, uh, I think it's important to understand that over time, Putin has become more and more paranoid about his own ability to rule Russia, right? He got a big boost, big injection uh, of popular support with the war in 2014, annexation of Crimea. Uh, you know, they're all hyped up on this nationalism that Neil was talking about after the Olympics. I was at I was at the Olympics or representing our country there. Um, and, you know, they decided to go in and, and you got a big boost. The Sochi Olympics just for. Our yeah, I'm sorry. Too. Sochi Olympics yeah. in 2014. Thank you, HR. Um, but that is fate. That has been fading. Um, um, and. Uh, that you know, there's not a there, he needs a new argument. The economy has has been you know not performing very well, uh, and so uh, I think you know there was this idea that another war to eliminate the the neo the Nazis. Remember, he's framing this as a war against Nazis. Uh, there was a calculation that a quick little war, successful war, would give him a new injection, and that hasn't happened. But before the war, remember. He shut down the last bits and pieces of independent news. Uh, he tried to kill the leading opposition figure, Mr. Navalny. And when that didn't work and Navalny went to, to Germany and then flew back, uh, he put him in prison. And then he just gave him more, nine more years. So, you know, talk about a badass. Uh, you know, I think Zelensky is a badass. Uh, and I think Navalny is a badass. We do live in a time of heroes. Uh, and, and those two are really heroic figures in my mind. Uh, but you're, you don't, you don't arrest 
the leading opposition figure, uh, if you're if you think that they only have two percent vote and they're not popular, you know that you those are things you do if you're paranoid about your leadership. And since he started this war, he also shut down Echo Moscovy, the only independent radio station. He shut down TV Rain. So I just tell you those data points to offset what I think are some overrated articles we've seen recently in the Western press about how popular Putin is. Um, and, and I would just say two things about that. Um, don't get me started on how we overwrite uh, stories based on you know bad data. Um, but just remember two things. One, uh, so I, I'm speaking about a New York Times piece that was in a couple of days ago saying Putin's really popular again, everything's hunky-dory. Uh, believe me, that is not my impression of elites in, in Russia. Uh, and I do teach a course on revolutions at Stanford from time to time. It's not babushkas in Siberia that, that uh, orchestrate revolutions. Uh, it's elites and capitals. So remember that data point. Second, um, that New York Times article um, uh, cited uh, the Levada Center, which is a company I know well. I've known them for 30 years. Yuri Levada was a friend of mine. It's really important for, for your listeners and, and viewers to remember that if you're sitting out there in, you know, uh, Ekaterinburg in the, you know, the middle of, of Russia, industrial town, and some stranger calls you from Moscow and says, hey, Ivan Ivanovich, I want to know, you know, what do you think of Putin? What do you think of the war? And you have no idea who this pollster is, right? Oh, I work for an independent polling company. Yeah, right. Uh, and everybody in Russia knows that they are listened to. There is only one rational answer to that question. Okay, so I just I think we need to put in parentheses our right. ability to understand popular attitudes in Russia. And there's this great piece by Timur Koran. He wrote it back in about 1989 about the logic, the rationality of, uh, of preference falsification when you live in these kinds of societies. I, I see that all the time. And I, I just think we should remember, we do not have a good feel uh, uh, for where people are. But let me give you two guesses. He fears his generals, because uh, like I said, you know, I, I, my guess is General Garasimov was not a big fan of this stupid war. Uh, you know, they had they had a pretty fat and happy life. They got all this, uh, you know, tons of corruption in the Russian military industrial complex, throwing money at them. They were doing just fine. You know, nobody challenged their tremendous, you know, uh, capabilities. They could show up for the May 9th parade every year and everybody celebrated them as these fantastic warriors. Uh, and now all of a sudden they were challenged on the battlefield. They don't that didn't look hasn't gone so well for them. My guess is that there's a lot of folks in the ranks of, of the military that are unhappy. It doesn't mean they'll challenge Putin, but dissatisfaction there. Um, but I don't see a mechanism. I want to be honest. I don't see a scenario under which there is a palace coup because, uh, remember, Putin is a KGB guy. He has dirt on everybody. He's listening to everybody. Uh, and that's the way that system works. Uh, second question, Bill, about a settlement. Um, first of all, I want to say two things. Uh, I interact with the Ukrainian government pretty often, probably every day. I, I just talked to President Zelensky 10 days ago or so. Uh, I met him when we, he, he came out to Stanford. I hosted him in the fall. Um, and uh, we've been training Ukrainians over at FSI for 20 years, just so you all know. Uh, I think we have 300 alums that have gone through our program, including one HR that was one of our fellows that, that you first came to FSI, the Leotard Fellowship, uh, uh, Alexei Goncharuk, the former prime minister, uh, who I just spoke to a couple of days ago, who's now in military fatigues and working in special Special I operation. posted him on the Battlegrounds podcast for any yes. of our viewers who want to catch up on Alexa. Yeah, he told me that. Right. Thank you for doing that. Uh, <laughs> and and just, just that's a kind of interesting thing in and of itself as a little story, right? He's an economist, former prime minister for, for Zelensky, and now you know he's working in intelligence. Uh, that's what they're all doing. I, but I want to say two things. I'm going on too long. Uh, number one, uh, my own analytic assessment as a just an outsider and again, I feel nervous saying things like this with General McMaster on the call, but HR, I'd love to hear your view on this. Uh, wars tend to end when one side wins or there's a stalemate on the battlefield. And uh, there's not a, neither side has won, thank God, but there's not a stalemate on the battlefield yet. 
Uh, and, and therefore, in my view, we need to do everything in the West and do it a lot faster to help to achieve that stalemate. Uh, and, and I don't like how slow things have gone. I don't like us second guessing what weapons uh, President Zelensky thinks he needs. Uh, my view is, you know, he's the guy in the bunker fighting. Uh, let's not second guess him. Uh, you know, if we think he doesn't need MiG-29s, get it to him and let him, you know, uh, show us uh, that he does or not. Uh, he thinks he does. I think we need to be doing more and faster. Maybe we'll get to that policy piece in a, in later. The second thing, however, I want to say is, you know, I hear this debate about whether it's good for us or bad for us for a long war or a short war. And to me, that's not for us to judge. Give me a break, man. Like, like, like that is Zelensky's decision. Uh, I think it's arrogant beyond belief, either for those to say he needs to constrain himself. God, for you know, somehow he needs to constrain the fight and we should constrain him in the fight. But I also think it's pretty arrogant of others to say, oh, this is a great war for us because it's, it's doing a lot of damage to Russia's military. Let's let Ukrainians die to fight the war that we don't want to fight. And I, I want to radically disassociate myself from that argument. From what I understand uh, from Ukrainians, uh, I have a friend who's on the delegation, uh, Rustan Omerov is his name. He's, he's one of the negotiators. Um, uh, here, here's my sense of where they think uh, the, the situation is. They're, they're winning in U winning around Kiev. Fantastic victory. I think if it, if it holds, it'll go down. You know, I'm reading, I'm re-educating re myself, uh, Neil, just so you know, we Russia types, we've been too educated from a imperial way about Ukrainian history. Uh, and, and I see that sometimes in my own thinking and by the way, I think that's a challenge that we at Hoover need to take on and we need to, uh, to help, uh, uh, you know, have independent Ukrainian studies on places like Stanford campuses because there is not enough. And, and I see this in my own writing. So uh, I but that will come back to that in a minute. Maybe just um, to interject the book that you showed us, but maybe too quickly for our viewers to see was so. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yes, it's, uh, uh, it's uh, wonderful gates of Europe, history of Ukraine. He was my colleague at Harvard uh, for a number of years of and uh, became a great friend. And uh, and he has indeed done a terrific job of, of educating us about uh, Ukraine. Uh, it was his book about the Yalta conference that persuaded me to make my first trip to Ukraine 10 years ago when I was invited to a conference there, a conference that can no longer be held in Yalta, of course. Wow, I didn't know that story, Neil. Yeah. Can I well, interject? You, you, so you said stalemate. Yeah, yeah. So let me. The goal is stalemate. And, and I, I want to open that question because the Ukrainians want the goal of a victory. And, and, and is our goal, the United States, stalemate means we kind of stop. Russia gets the eastern half of the country. Uh, Ukraine is in some sense neutralized and we sit down to 70 years of, of sanctions and, and wait for Putin to, to die. The, what the Ukrainians want is to win. They want to go on the offensive. They want to kick the Russians the hell out of the country. Uh, and their goal is a territorially, uh, in, uh, a full territorial integrity of everything, including Crimea. They want to be an independent country, able to choose its own foreign alliances and economic system. That's what they're calling win. And yes. what they are screaming loudly is we need heavy equipment to do this, uh, right. which we, we are not giving them right now. So we, we seem to be in the point that the U.S., wants this stalemate and partition the country and sit forever and ukraine wants to win and the real question is do we do we let them win there's a well, third possibility that we can't leave out of this discussion and that is that there are still ways that putin can escalate that could radically alter the situation we, we need to, I think we need to think carefully here, and it's what really an important point that I want to put to Mike and also to HR. Uh, we're dealing here with a regime with nuclear weapons, more nuclear warheads. Than wait, wait, wait a minute, country. Neil. There's, there's escalate in terms of do more to win in Ukraine, which it seems to me he's doing everything he can. Then there's escalate in terms of do something crazy to get the rest of us to, to back down. No, I don't uh, that's agree with a different, that, That's a different move. No, I think the thing here I would say, and, I, and then I want to hand over to maybe we should get HR's take on this. Yeah. There's still a scenario that Putin can win a conventional victory in the east of Ukraine, encircle and, and defeat the Ukrainian forces in the Donbass. 
Right. And my assumption is that that's what they're now going to try and do, but they may fail because they are, they've suffered tremendously high casualties, far higher than he can have expected. I think higher than almost anybody expected. So effective has been the Ukrainian defense. So my concern is that if they cannot achieve the limited conventional victory in the east of the country that would allow them to say, all right, we want the whole of the Donbass and maybe a land bridge from Crimea, there is the nightmare scenario that a man uh, who has shown himself capable of executing civilians in cold blood has certainly uh, connived at the use of chemical weapons in Syria, could use a tactical nuclear weapon against the west of Ukraine, where the weapons, of course, are coming through from Poland. And I think we're not giving enough, we're not attaching a high enough probability to that scenario when we talk about Ukrainian victory, or particularly when President Biden talks about regime change uh, in Russia. I worry that we are creating a very dangerous situation. And the better things go for Ukraine in the conventional war, the higher the probability that Putin uses his weapons of mass destruction. This is really a question for both Mike and HR, but it's the thing that worries me the most right now. Well, let me talk about the Ukrainian perspective, and then I'll, I'll hand it over to HR about uh, those how you make probability assessments about what Neil's describing. Those are really hard questions. So I want to be clear. Uh, do I want Ukraine to win? My personal view? Of course. Uh, um, uh, do I want the West to do more? My, my position on the West is uh, I will support uh, President Biden's view for a no-fly zone as long as he supports, and I've had a chance to talk to his most senior people, including him one time, uh, as long as he supports that we give him every weapon available below that. Uh, so that's my personal view. That, 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 let's set that aside. And, and I'm not a military expert, so let's, let's hear from HR about that. On the Ukrainian, but I, Bill, you asked me about what I was not what I want, but what I think will happen. Those are two different things. Um, and my my sense, and I like I say, I talk to Ukrainians pretty often, um, uh, including his chief of staff, uh, who I talk to pretty often as well. They're rhetoric publicly, of course, they're they're saying that we want to win. I don't know of any Ukrainians in the government that think that they can remove. Russia from Crimea, or they can remove Russia from Donbass. I, they, they just don't think they have the military capabilities to do that. Uh, but they're not going to say that. That would be absurd to say before a negotiation. And, but here's the rub. Here's what they do want. And here, I think, is where the, 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 three, the three and a half big issues of the negotiations are, just to give you my assessment of the update. So one, they're ready to... Uh, declare neutrality, and they can't declare it, by the way. They have to have a referendum to do it. Uh, they're willing to do that. I think President Zelensky is quite frustrated with the NATO alliance. I don't think. I know he is. He uh, And so his enthusiasm to wait around for several years while we think about you know, when they qualify for a map again, I think he's off of that. He, he just sees that as a, a no-win. That's a dead end. But so that's why he's come up with this very creative, but I think also very difficult. And here I want to hear uh, what others think, especially HR, he said, okay, I'll go to the Ukrainian people to get neutrality into the constitution. If you give our country, uh, and the U is the UN Security Council, plus Poland, plus Turkey, and I think he has Israel even on the list, a security guarantee that looks like the security guarantee that is written in the NATO tra treaty, Article 5 commitment. That's really innovative, but I don't understand how we get to that. And HR, I'd be curious if you can think about that. Uh, that's number one. That's on. That's that's their their new idea. Number two is on the on the borders. Uh, before you know, two weeks ago, their position was, we will agree to disagree where the borders are, and uh, but we're not going to. You know, Putin was saying you have to recognize Crimea and Donbas, and Zelensky said no way. But we will agree to only reunify our country through peaceful means. That was the that was the the before before this hor horrible week before Bucha. But but two weeks ago, that was their their what I think was an incredibly brave, and I'm not sure that that the Ukrainian people would support it. But that was what was on the table. 
Uh, and then three is about the size of the mil military, uh, which I think has to be as big as uh, it can be and armed to the teeth with our best weapons. You know, no more S-300s, Patriots. Uh, and and the, the only real security guarantee is gonna be the Ukrainian military. The problem with that is that Putin's decided he's not ready to do that. And to your point, Neil, I, I, I think everybody who I know that, you know, in the Ukrainian uh, government that follows us closely, Putin has decided he's gonna go for victory. Uh, I mean, he couldn't take Mariupol through normal military means. So he's just, he's destroying it. As, as one of my Ukrainian friends said, this is our Stalingrad, Mike. So he's just destroying it. He's bombing it to rubble. He's killing children. Uh, but eventually he wants to connect the map and then he wants to start negotiations. And I think by upping the ante, that's going to make it really hard for Zelensky. Zelensky. Is, is that enough for us? That might be enough for the Ukrainians. That's what they can get out of a bad situation. But the U.S., NATO, those of us who want to live in a civilized world for the next 50 years, is it OK that he gets to invade, chew off part of a country, and then we sit and leave it partitioned for a while? Is that what we want to tell Xi Jinping? Is that what we want to tell the Iranians? Because, you know, I, and, of, and of course, you know, even if there is some kind of an agreement, that's not the end of it. I mean, look at how many times, you know, the Russians have come up with these, you know, these proposals for humanitarian quarters in the Syrian civil war, for example. All they were were opportunities for them to get ready for the next episode of mass homicide. And, you know, the, you know, the, you know, the I mean, the, the Ukrainians know this. Right. And so I think it's really important to go back to some fundamentals. Like what does winning in war entail? It means convincing your enemy that your enemy has been defeated. People keep talking about off ramps for Putin. Hey, we need to close the off ramps. We ought to help him accelerate into the brick wall that he's headed for. And, you know, what's really important, I think, to understand is that, you know, I mean, to go back to G.K. Chesterton, right? War is not the best way of settling differences, but it's the only way to ensure they're not settled for you. And I think this is really what the Ukrainians have figured out, obviously, and it is the basis of the incredible courage and resilience we've seen. The Russian losses are staggering. As they withdraw, we are just now getting visibility of the extent of those losses. The Russian army is in retreat. They're going to try to consolidate in the Donbass. They're going to try to reinvigorate their offensive in the south. But if they do that, they will get their asses kicked again. This is an army that is incompetent at anything except rubbling cities. That's the only thing that they can do. And to get to, you know, to, to get to, to Neil's uh, concern about escalation, how come Russia's not concerned about us escalating? Because we keep taking everything off the table. It's crazy. You know, so I, I agree with Mike. We should give them everything the hell we can give them. And you know what? If you don't like a Russian, you escalate. Maybe the Black Sea fleet goes away. Maybe every ship in the Black Sea goes away. You know, I'll tell you, I, I think that Russia is so weak at this point conventionally. I think the Lithuanian army could march on St. Petersburg. So, I mean, if you, they want to talk about escalating to Poland, Poland would kick their ass right now. So I, I just alone, let alone if, if and of course, this would all invoke Article 5 for NATO. And Putin has to know he has to know if he uses the most destructive weapons on Earth, he doesn't survive it. He doesn't survive it. Now, and, I, and, and, and I'll tell you, and, and, we could, and we could ensure that by conventional means, by the way, if, if necessary. Uh, we forgot the don't part of don't take counsel of our fears. You know, you, know, you know what kills me? Why is our embassy still not open in Kiev? I mean, we've apparently gotten very good at evacuating places, you know, but, but, but as, as Churchill said, evacuations after Dunkirk, you know, evacuations don't win wars. So I, I just think that it's time to stop taking stuff off the table. It's time to give him everything the hell we can give him and to recognize that, that, that Putin has to conclude that he's defeated. Because you know what? Even if there's any kind of some kind of an agreement, as I mentioned, I mean, that's not going to be the end. It's just going to be a chance for him to, to refit and prepare for the next phase of, of an offensive on Ukraine and, and, and on, the, on the Western world broadly. You know, look, look at what he's doing also. He's you know, trying to encourage separatist movements in the Balkans right now, Serbian separatist movements. You've, see, you've seen what he's already occupied Belarus. Look at the pressure he's putting on Moldova at the same time. as I mean, you know, look at what he's still doing in Syria. Okay, this is not happening in, in isolation. And I think it's really important to, to understand that, that Putin has to conclude that he's been defeated. Russia's the, and the people around him have to conclude that they've been defeated. HR, I always enjoy your fighting words. But in my view, 
there's a risk here that you're underestimating. If I'm right that we're dealing here with a fascist regime, fascist regimes tend not to feature broadcasts by the leader which begin with an apology and end with a resignation. If Putin's losing in the way that you describe as a result of our potentially escalating or at least threatening to escalate, I don't think he goes quietly into the night. No, but hey, Neil, I would just say escalating, escalating by giving the Ukrainians the, the capabilities. They no, need I don't, to I don't disagree with any of that. That's, I don't that's not an escalation. With, let's I mean, be clear. Be... I agree with Mike that we failed to arm the Ukrainians sufficiently in the last few years, not mm -hmm. just last year, but the year before too. And we now have a moral obligation uh, to help them fight their war. But I think to talk of victory over Putin, Putin's defeat, raises the question of how will Putin play that? Because I think we have to consider very seriously what defeat means hey, for let, him. Let, let him worry about that, Neil. You don't let him worry about it. We need know. to worry about it too, HR, because no, no, of the very serious risk of the use of a nuclear weapon, which would be a massive transformative event in world historical terms, would signal the end, really, of a, of a of a peace that has held since 1945. Nobody's used the nuclear weapon in anger since then. I worry he can do it. I also worry that we don't know what we will do if he does that, because the Biden administration has distinctly hesitated to use the language of deterrence throughout this crisis. Indeed, when Putin first mentioned the possibility of nuclear escalation, we took the Polish jets off the table. So I worry about the scenario you're describing it sounds great. Ukraine wins, Putin defeated. The administration seems to think there's a regime change in Russia. We all live happily ever after. Oh, and by the way, the Chinese get the message, don't mess with the West. Well, that would be great. But I happen to live in a historically grounded world in which there are also very adverse scenarios under those circumstances. What do fascist dictators do when a defeat stares them in the face? And that also means, of course, they're overthrown, probably death. And Neil, and if so they have weapons yeah. of mass destruction, they use them. Hitler didn't have an atomic weapon, but he used everything else in his arsenal until the very end. But that's what we got to. We got to think about this and not just assume. So, Neil, what, there's a magical what, end. To what this would story. you have? What, what is your alternative then? Okay, so if we if we're proposing here that the Biden administration, that the, the NATO countries, that you know the the free world. You know, just pull out the stops, right? Give, 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 you know, give Zelensky everything that he needs to defend his people and to end the the, the mass homicide of 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 his civilians. Uh, so, what's the alternative to that? Not do that, so that so that we can you know, uh, so that we can tell to Putin, listen, you know, we're we're not escalating, you know, we're not gonna we're not gonna help Zelensky. I mean, I, what what's the alternative? I mean, I just don't understand. You, you, you know, and there's a, there's a, it, there is a risk of inaction as well it is as not risk a of credible action. goal of U.S. foreign policy to achieve regime change in Moscow and potentially the breakup of the Russian Empire. No, that's that that's be fine. our goal, Neil, Neil. That's fine. I agree with that. I agree with but that. The goal that's, should that's be to end the. As I've been saying for weeks now, we need to end the war as soon as possible. We need to be taking every action that we can to stop the fighting rather than to let it play out on whose terms possibility Neil, on... that it ends with ukraine a charnel house let, let me be the no, but i'm telling here. you the, the, what i'm saying though is i look forward to the fighting if the fighting right too. now ends right I, the fighting I, I, I right now like, ends <laughs> let me it doesn't end it doesn't end together. with a ceasefire it you doesn't end with why it's called goodfellas it's already like an italian restaurant let me propose i'm stopping i'm stopping now i want to propose a ceasefire between you guys like this well, I, I do want to get in on this conversation because I think it's fundamental. Uh, and let's let's break down a few parameters and then isolate on the tactical nuclear weapon use or not. To, to, to me, that's the that's the area of should be the focal point. So first, remember when Putin went to war uh, right around that time, he hinted that you know if we get involved, we might use we, we might have to use our nuclear weapons. Let's let's put that in parentheses. Uh, from the best of my uh, knowledge, talking to very senior Pentagon officials, uh, they've done nothing to put their nuclear, their strategic nuclear weapons on some higher alert. So that was a complete bluff. Okay. Number two, uh, not, and then there's some more good news here. Last weekend, uh, but others that didn't, but he went into detail about it. Uh, the former president of Russia, uh, his name is Dmitry Medvedev. He's a deputy secretary of their security council. He spelled out the conditions under which Russia would use nuclear weapons. And they were all existential threats to Russia. 
And that's good news because nobody's threatening Russia's existential existence. So I think strategic was taken off the table. Two, escalation. HR, I'm glad you, you really focused on that word because when I heard that uh, we're not going to send the MiG-29s for fear of escalation and the intelligence community is telling us, HR, you know, you know how that works, right? I remember many times when we rolled out the IC, you know, to hide behind, to explain our policy behind them. You know, on what basis were they making that argument? And define escalation for me. Um, you know, I, I know the head of the CIA pretty well. Uh, I would love to get Bill Burns on your program and say, what exactly were you guys talking about on that? Because I don't, if you've taken off strategic nuclear weapons, then I don't think there's a credible escalatory threat against NATO. You're losing against Ukraine and suddenly you're gonna strike out at the best alliance in the world anchored by the most powerful military in the world? No, that makes no sense to me. But then that gets me to bracket this to Neil's point about the tactical nuclear weapon. To me, that is the one place that, 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 that uh, a madman, somebody losing, might use the weapon. And I have no way to assess the probabilities of that. And, and you know, I think that's where we should focus our energies and attentions. And when I, when I ask my government friends, you know, what do you know of that? They don't give me very good answers. Uh, so I would just say that is the one area. But on the other stuff, uh, I, I think the, the, the MiG-29 fiasco, uh, you know, use that as a metaphor. Everything needs to be brought in because even if you want, if I wrote this in a piece the other day, no matter what scenario, uh, Russia occupying all of, of Ukraine and doing what Stalin did after 1945, that that's off the table, right? He doesn't have the the man. He doesn't have the military to do it. He doesn't have the idea. That's that's good news. The other two scenarios, how the war ends, either Ukraine winning or stalemate, both of those outcomes, uh, even if we can't predict them, require that we give them more weapons and that we increase more sanctions. So on the on in terms of our agency. We, no matter which of those scenarios you're in, you should do more on the weapons and do more on the same. Can, can I just I add a couple, a couple of things quickly, John? W one other thing which hasn't been mentioned is we're still not doing nearly enough to apply pressure to the Russian economy. And it is a scandal that the German government continues to oppose the oil embargo that right. really would be a crippling blow to the economy. So I think there are two things that we need to be doing from the Western side arming the Ukrainians more effectively, but also making sure that it is a, a, a meaningful a, a sanctions package. But the thing that I want to ask you, Mike, is about what would Putin consider a satisfactory outcome? There's a paradox here. Back in July last year, he publishes an article on the historic unity of the Russian and Ukrainian people. And the propaganda is that Ukrainians and Russians aren't really separate people, but there are these fascists who've taken power in, uh, in Kiev who have to be uh, exterminated. That's the basic official line. And yet the destruction that he's inflicted on large parts of Ukraine already seems to suggest an almost completely diametrically opposite strategy, which is the destruction of Ukraine as a viable country, period, with as much loss of life as that entails. I worry, and this is why I keep coming back to the nuclear threat, that Putin can nuke Lviv and continue a, a, a campaign, maybe with further weapons of destruction that leaves Ukraine a wreck with more rubble than we can even imagine. And what do we do if that becomes his goal? The destruction of Ukraine with death tolls that will be in the hundreds of thousands. I figured out that if you drop a, a, a tactical nuclear weapon on Lviv, 300,000 people die, roughly. Not what, just what in, and not just in Ukraine, not just yeah. in Ukraine, obviously, you know, if you I mean, this is Moldova, this is Romania, this is Bulgaria, this is Poland. Right. But I mean, I, but I think he limits because he has to. He limits the war to Ukraine because he daren't take on NATO for the reasons we've discussed. But he inflicts such destruction on Ukraine with the WMD that he has that we are presented with a quandary. What do well, we this do? Is, this is escalate to, to de-escalate. This is his whole. This is his whole. Yeah, but, you know. But what do we do? Theory. I haven't, as Mike says, I haven't heard anything convincing from anybody of the administration about what we do if that if that is his next move. 
I, I, I want to go back to squaring the circle between you guys, <clears throat> which was, you know, was rightly concerned when, when a dictator feels like he is, his power is in danger, he strikes out and is liable to send V2 rockets to London, as, as an example. But <clears throat> the, the squaring the circle is, um, the goal is Ukraine to win and to reestablish a country and not one inch into Russian territory. In fact, uh, you know, we then need to end the war rather quickly. And I think that's the way you, you, you make it clear this is about winning back Ukraine, but this is not about regime change in Russia. And there, Biden's latest gaffe, I think, was particularly, if you're going to say regime change in Russia, then you better be willing to do it. And saying regime change in Russia just is exactly the opposite of what you do. Uh, you're right, Neil, with somebody with nuclear weapons. Yeah, um, clear out of Ukraine, but our objective stops at right at the Russian border, as does the Ukraine. We don't support the Ukrainians one inch into Russian territory after they've won back their country. Because I think Neil is exactly right. We talked earlier about um, uh, Putin cannot win in Ukraine in the sense he can't pacify the Ukrainian people, and he's figured that out. And so what he wants to do is the women and children move to Poland, and he's going to kill the men and destroy the cities and, and repopulate it with Russians or whatever he wants to do. And I think that, that that's another reason why we need to let the Ukrainians win this war as, as soon as possible and then stop right at the Russian border. So we're running out of, so we're running out of time here. So I want to just get your quick closing thoughts on this. I ask this every time I talk about Ukraine. What are you looking at next? HR, are you looking at the peace talks in Istanbul? Are you looking at what's going on in the battlefield? Or are you looking at something completely different? Well, I'm just looking at the recent decisions on to provide more assistance to the Ukrainians, how that's executed and, and how that bolsters their military capabilities, as well as what Neil alluded to is wh when do we, you know, wh when do we sanction the 59 percent of their exports in the hybrid, uh, the hydrocarbon sector? We, we have to do it and it's going to be painful. But, you know, hey, it's not going to be as painful as what the Ukrainians are going through right now. Mm -hmm. John, what are you watching? I'm watching the, the fecklessness in Washington, uh, but I perhaps the slow process by which we are all coming to terms with things, especially economics. Um, I don't put, you know, sanctions over the long run, I, I don't think are going to be that effective. Uh, they haven't done a whole lot in Cuba, North Korea, and, and elsewhere. Um, if we, the problem is not so much the selling of the oil. The problem is that you want to stop is them from importing crucial things they need to keep their economy going up. Uh, can't hurt, but let's get serious about the stuff that can, that really matters. Mm -hmm. Neil, you have a great talent to look around the corner. What do you, what do you have your eye on right now? Well, I think two things in particular. Uh, one, what happens when the Russians have relocated their forces, having abandoned uh, the battle for Kiev, and uh, begin their attempted encirclement uh, of Ukrainian forces in the Donbass? Is mm -hmm. that going to fail? If it fails, Paradoxically, I get very worried because at that point, Putin is in a desperate situation. His last shot at winning a uh, an apparent victory, one he can sell at home, is the battle for the Donbass that is approaching in the coming days and weeks. Second thing is, does the shock of the atrocities in Butcher finally force the German government's hand and lead to the oil embargo that is so badly needed, and which in any case... Uh, well-qualified German economists say that they can yes. well afford. Those are the two things that I think will really be decisive in the in the short run. But of course, I've made clear my great fear is that there is uh, missing from our strategic calculus a sufficient awareness of the nuclear risk that Putin poses. Okay, and Ambassador McFall, besides studying up on the manly benefits of deer antler blood, what are you what are you looking at next? Well, in the short term, of course, it's all about oil and gas sanctions. It always has been, by the way. Many of us have been writing about that for a long time. Uh, but I think Bucha has created a moment uh, in time where we can look at this. And by the way, very talented people that study uh, both academics and those that have worked on sanctions before mm -hmm. say that it is doable. This, this notion is not doable. It's a political decision. It's not an economic decision. One of my colleagues, his name is Sergei Guryev. He's a, an economist, used to be the chief economist of the EBRD. Mm -hmm. uh, he's now in France, uh, Russia. And he, he and a colleagues have put together a pretty interesting study that show this is doable uh, if there's political will to do it. And I completely agree with everybody else. That's important. Um, uh, and then second, it, the war is shifting to Donbass. The war has been shifted to Donbass. Let's be clear. Mariupol has been the, the focal point of the Russian military for a long time. Uh, these incredibly brave people fighting in Mariupol, uh, you know, have been holding out. Uh, I, I, my prediction is they will finally run out. They, they are running out of uh, ammunition and they, they can't be uh, they're running out of food. They, they boil, you know, snow to drink water. I mean, it's 
I, I, and by the way, I also predict when we finally, if we ever do get any videos of what happened in Mariupol, it's going to make Bucha look very calm because it is, from what I hear from my Ukrainian colleagues, it's just completely horrific what they've done there. But when Mariupol falls, uh, if Mariupol falls, uh, but I think that it will, will that be a moment that Putin uh, tries to sue for peace or will he keep going? And I, I don't think we know the answer to that. Um, and therefore, it, to me, it's just more weapons as fast as can be. Uh, there's no excuse why all the S-300s that we have in our system, from what I understand, there's still one stuck. Why? Like enough, you know, HR, you, you know, enough of those White House situation room meetings deliberating about decisions. Just get it done. And I would just say the other thing, get it done quietly. Uh, you know, NATO doesn't, NATO needs to operate as an alliance, not Poland versus the United States. They need to make decisions quietly and then do things quietly. I think the mistake of the MiG-29s was there was too much stuff in public. And, and I would just say, do it and do it quietly. Help the Ukrainians win and let them define what win means. To answer, you know, we all had our definitions. When, when they say they've won, uh, we should respect their definition of winning. And that's it for this episode of Goodfellas. We will be back very soon with a new show. On behalf of my Hoover colleagues, Neil Ferguson, John Cochran, H.R. McMaster, our guest today, Ambassador Michael McFall. We hope you enjoyed the conversation. Till we meet again, take care. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this show and are interested in watching more content featuring H.R. McMaster, watch Battlegrounds, also available at hoover.org.